So let's talk about evapotranspiration. So today we're going to discuss the physical processes of evaporation and transpiration. We usually talk about those in conjunction with each other, combined evapotranspiration. We'll understand the fundamentals of evaporation itself, the process and the measure and measuring it, which is hard to do. Rain falls hard, snow is harder, evaporation's even harder to actually quantify without a lot of uncertainty. We'll estimate evaporation using water and energy balance methods, so mass balance, energy balance, and then talk about how we can use this to apply for crop irrigation management. All right, so let's talk about the actual process of evaporation on a physical level. And what we've got here is, let me just use my, we've got a surface of water Let's see if I can change my, no. Okay, great. So we've got a surface of water here and these are all the little water molecules on it. And water molecules are jumping into the air and coming out. We talked about this when we're talking about condensation. And so those water molecules in the air create a vapor pressure, right? Which is the partial pressure of water vapor in the atmosphere. And You've got the temperature at the surface of the water, you get the air temperature, the saturation vapor pressure, which is just a function of temperature. And then you've got the vapor pressure that actually exists, the actual vapor pressure. So the rate of evaporation is the net rate at which molecules move from the saturated surface layer. So right above that water surface, it's saturated, right? This is saturated vapor pressure. Or the, the E is equal to ES saturation, right above that layer. Um, so we got to move from that saturated layer into the air above, and, the, and that's proportional to the difference between the vapor pressure at the surface layer and the vapor pressure in the atmosphere. So we've got saturated vapor pressure right there above the water, and then you've got basically the vapor pressure relative humidity in the air around. So it's proportional to that difference. And, and that's intuitive, right? Because when it's really dry, we know that things evaporate quickly. And when it's really moist in the air, relative humidity is high, evaporation rates tend to be lower. All things being equal. So depending on the temperature of the surface and the temperature and humidity of the air, the difference between the two vapor pressures can be positive, zero, or negative. So here's our saturation vapor pressure. If our um, vapor pressure in the air or relative humidity is not 100%, then we get evaporation. Um, if it's less, then we have water condensing. So that means there's, um, there's more water vapor in the air than there is uh, on the water surface. And then if they're equal, then we don't get condensation or evaporation. Usually we're in this thing, right? Usually we have a vapor pressure that is less than saturated vapor pressure, and so evaporation is occurring. This is, this is what we're talking about right here. So here's a, just a look at what happens to the 4.2, sorry, 4,200 billion gallons of water that falls over the US on an average year. All right, so 4.2 trillion gallons of water that rains over the US and snows over the US. 67% of that evapotranspires. It's a lot. We consume 2%, yeah. So they, they, they always like talk about like cloud cleaning and everything like that. Is there any research on trying to prevent evapotranspiration with the discharge? Yes. So um, I didn't, I, I, that'd be a great slide to have in here. There is in, in LA and in, in California, Southern California, 
they've done, they put these plastic balls on their reservoir. So these, these plastic balls and what they do is they basically are like mirrors, they reflect the energy of the sun. So they, they, it's basically, they could, instead of putting like a tarp down, like, right, you can't put a tarp down a whole reservoir, but they just fill it in with these. I mean, they kind of look like playpen balls and they reflect the sun's energy off of the reservoir. You don't do that for something like Lake Powell. This is more like a smaller type of thing, but that's, people aren't doing that very often. I think that in, in Southern California, they're pretty uh, miserly. They, they, they not, I wouldn't say they're miserly. They, they watch where their water goes. Yeah. Um, but as far as like, you don't want to like put a blanket over a, a field, right? <laughs> like the tarp over. The only way to stop evapotranspiration is to like kill everything and have no plants. <laughs> Which, I mean, like it, I read a, a book. It's um, it's fiction, and so it's looking at the future when we have mega drought for decades. And um, in that book, there's a people will get paid to take out um, what are called. Uh, um, I'm going to forget the name now, but anyway, plants that, that have their roots go all the way down to the water table near rivers. And so tamarisk is one of them, cottonwoods another, willow. So they go out and they just pull all the tamarisk and all the plants off the river so they don't suck the water away. Yeah, that was their job. We're not, we're not there yet, but um, that's one way people, that is actually, I mean, tamarisk is a big one in the desert that can, evapotranspire a lot. And so it's an invasive species. We want to get it out anyway. So that is one evapotranspiration control you can have. So 30% flows out or just under 30% flows out, just under 70% is evapotranspired. Some of it goes into the groundwater, meaning it's like long-term storage. And then we use about 2%. Let's talk about transpiration. So we kind of looked at evaporation at the microscopic level. We'll keep talking about it more. Transpiration is, so evaporation is just water. It could be on soil, it could be on a lake, and it's evaporating, right? Transpiration is the water travels through the plant. So the roots take the water out of the soil. You've got water molecules in the soil, it goes into the roots. There's actually a suction system here. So you can see in the soil, there's negative pressure in the soil, meaning if you want to get the water out of the soil, you have to apply suction. Once you get into the root xylem, the kind of you know little tubes and, and ways that we get water into the trees and the roots, the suction is even greater. So you can see there's a gradient of suction here. There's more suction in the root xylem, so you're able to actually draw water in physically through suction. So it's sucking the water in like a straw. And then as it heads up, that suction has to increase, right? Because we're working against this gradient of gravity. And so the suction increases all the way till we get to a leaf and then the outside air. So there's this, this, this system of negative pressure that's generated by, evapor by transpiration. And so when we're losing water at the top, we're creating that suction gradient down here for the bottom. Um, the water molecules leave the leaves through stoma, these little holes, these are little molecular sized holes in the leaf. Actually, they're bigger than, they're cellular sized holes. These are cells. Um, and these can open and close to let different amounts of water vapor out, depending on how much water the tree has in it. Um, transpiration ratio. So this is the ratio of the pounds of dry matter, organic matter produced per pound of water. So pounds of water per pound of organic matter. Um, so a Bermuda grass or fescue alfalfa, look at this, alfalfa takes 400 pounds of water to create one pound of alfalfa, dry alfalfa. It's pretty crazy. It's the one of the biggest evapotranspires. Corn is um, a little less than half of that. Sorghum even less. Wheat kind of middle, middle ground. Alfalfa is the kind of biggest consumer of water. Here's what our stomata look like at the plant level. There's these little pores. And inside the plant, you've got water moving through um, and it's, the stoma can open and close. 
they're bringing in carbon dioxide, they're ejecting water vapor and oxygen. Um, and like I said, they can open and close depending on how much water content they have inside. So stream flow can actually be affected by evapotranspiration. And you're talking about, can we do anything to control and reduce evapotranspiration if we wanna keep water you know, in the ground, in the soil, in the rivers? Well, um, you, you can actually see um, when we have kind of base flow conditions like later in the summer and you've got a big riparian forest. So these are trees, here's our stream. Um, that stream is being fed by groundwater when it's not raining, right? The, the groundwater is draining out and going into the stream. The trees are intercepting that groundwater and evapotranspiring it. So you can see this signal, this is just a cartoon, but this actually exists. You can see the signal every day when the trees, when the sun's out, they're sucking a bunch of water out of the ground, the stream level will go down, and then at nighttime, it'll come back up again. You know, it might be a really tiny signal, but you can actually see that. So the stream level will be higher at night and lower at day, daytime. Okay. And so when it comes to plants evapotranspiring, there's this, there's kind of two, two metrics we can think about. One is potential evapotranspiration, and that is when we're not limited by the amount of water in the soil. And the other is actual evapotranspiration. And so if we look at the ratio, this is actual to potential evapotranspiration. Um, you've got, and then here's soil moisture. So at, at one, we're basically, we're not saturated, but we have as much water as the soil can hold on its own. We'll get into soil moisture um, on Tuesday a little bit more. But basically, this is the total water available to the plant. We've kind of maximized that here. It's really wet. Um, we're going to have the maximum amount of evapotranspiration possible because we're not limited by the amount of water in the soil. But once that soil moisture goes down um, to about halfway between the permanent wilting point, this is where you can't, the plant can no longer suck any more water out of the soil. Once you get to that halfway point, you know, theoretically, then the actual evapotranspiration rate goes down. And so we're not evapotranspiring as much as we could because we're limited by soil moisture. And so here's just some actual data that shows um, if your one is saturated and zero is totally dry, um, this is the measured evapotranspiration rate um, divided by the potential evapotranspiration rate. So it reduces as their soil dries out. So the main factors that affect transpiration are the temperature, the humidity in the air, the wind and air movements. So we talked about water molecules kind of um, coming out over the surface. If it's really windy, you're always going to be removing that saturated surface of water molecules over the water, and so you have more evaporation. So wind is actually a really important part. Soil moisture availability, how much is available for the plants to transpire, and then the type of plant. We saw that certain plants, really, they don't have a lot of stomata. They're storing water in their bodies, the plant bodies themselves, and other plants they're going gangbusters and, and evapotranspiring like crazy. Here's a breakdown of different kinds of evapotranspiration or evaporation. So at the top, we have free water evaporation. This is what's coming off of open water or lakes. We obviously have an unlimited supply. And so there's no, um, you know, the evaporation rate is going to be what it is based on the availability of the water. So the water's there, the temperature's there relative humidity, et cetera. Um, this is kind of theoretical. The lake evaporation, there's going to be um, some stored energy. That is that the lake water is gonna change temperatures over the day. And that change in lake temperature could influence the evaporation rate. Um, so bare soil evaporation is gonna be limited to the amount of water um, available to evaporate, and then transpiration is going to be limited to the soil moisture and the plant type that we've talked about. So let's get into some methods for actually calculating evapotranspiration. The first one is, it kind of makes sense from a, um, 
in our intuitive standpoint, we just track how much water is entering and leaving. So if this is a reservoir, I've got water running in from a stream, I've got water coming out of a stream or a dam or something like that. Um, I've got rain coming in and I have surface seepage going into the groundwater. And so if we sum all these up, we say evaporation is what we're gonna calculate. It's equal to precipitation plus all of our surface inflows and outflows. And then all of our subsurface inflows and outflows. Minus any change in storage. So does the lake go up or does it go down over time? So if we know all these numbers, we can calculate evapotranspiration, but why is this a challenging method, Christian? This was in the, in the quiz, I think. Why, why does this method not really work out all the time? At the bottom, yeah. So the subsurface part, that's really hard to measure. It's not too hard to measure surface flow. We know all the creeks that are coming in, the rivers that are coming in. That's not too hard to measure. We can measure the lake going up and down. That's easy to measure. And if we know, you know, the bathymetry or the shape of the lake, we can translate that to a volume. But we really don't know the subsurface loss and that's hard to measure. Imagine trying to measure this up at, um, you know, Blue Mesa Reservoir or something like that, right? It's just, it's just not possible. You can do some estimations. Maybe you go out there in the winter time when you know evaporation is really low and you can get some estimate, you know what the stream flow is coming in there. Maybe you could estimate it there. So water budget method is intuitive. Again, it's hard to actually, actually measure. So here's all the data we would need, stream gauges, rain gauges, reservoir stage and volume. And then um, maybe we can compare uh, pan evaporation, which we'll talk about, to the, to the lake evaporation. So because of uncertainties, maybe we're at plus or minus 20% given the uncertainties in the data. So pan evaporation is a way we can measure evaporation directly, right, from a big metal pan. But um, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. What's happening in a lake is not going to be what's happening in this metal pan right next to the lake. And, and why is that, Val? What's the difference between the pan and the lake? Doesn't it reflect more? Why does it evaporate more? Metal? Yeah, because it's metal. It's this little metal thing and then the metal gets hot in the sun, right? The water is gonna be much hotter here than it is in the lake. So what you end up with is um, you have these lake, these, these pan evaporation to lake evaporation coefficients, anywhere from half to 80%, something like that. And so whatever, um, oh yeah, and then, we, and then we can measure the evaporation in the pan by seeing what changes in the depth. S1 and S2 are gonna be the differences in depth over time. So I measure this at 9 a.m. yesterday, I measure this at 9 a.m. today, I see what the water changed. Um, and then I see how much rain came in. And so then between those two uh, changes, I can actually uh, evaluate the evaporation. So this pan coefficients uh, is gonna change seasonally, right? Because it's based on temperature. The hotter the water is, the more your vapor pressure is coming off of that water. More molecules are jumping out into the air. So your pan coefficient, if you take the average over the year, maybe it's 0.7, but in February it could be super low because the water is going to be colder than the lake. The lake, lake water will be warmer in the winter than it will be in a little tiny pan because the tiny pan is going to cool up and, and heat up and cool down more quickly than the lake would. And then it uh, could be even much higher in, in different months. So it's not a perfect thing. It's just kind of another, another way to do it, but there's still some uncertainty there. Here's another one where we're measuring evapotranspiration. It's called a lysimeter. And there's a lot of different ways to do this, but the idea is you dig a big old hole in the ground, you put in something that can measure. So here's our lysimeter right here. 
uh, put it in some gravel or something like that, and you're gonna weigh um, this over time. And so you can see how much water comes in by the rain, so we have a rain gauge. Um, we know how much water is leaving the bottom to groundwater, we can catch it down here. And then we see what the weight is. So what, what's the change in, in soil moisture or water storage, which you can just measure by weight here over time. And so this is like a super direct way, obviously very expensive. And you're, you're gonna do this you know, at a research plot. Here's a weather, weather gauges. And, um, CSU has a bunch of lysimeters installed near agricultural fields so they can get a better, more accurate measurement of evapotranspiration. So we had a paradox that happened um, back in the early 2000s, where we saw that global temperature was increasing over time from the 1960s, 1970s. Here's the average global temperature. So we see this um, pretty big increase in global temperature, but pan evaporation rates have been decreasing over the last 50 years. And we'd expect, because we know that evaporation increases with temperature, we would expect that pan evaporation would increase too, but they have these pans all over the country and they're seeing that the average rates are, are decreasing. So what's going on? There's a big studies in Science Magazine, uh, the cause of decreased pan evaporation. Paradoxically, terrestrial observations over the past 50 years show the reverse. Here we show that the decrease in evaporation is consistent with what we would expect from widespread decreases in sunlight in resulting from increased cloud coverage and aerosol concentration. So what was happening over the last 50 years is that we were getting an increase in cloud coverage and aerosols. Aerosols really just smoke, uh, dust, that sort of thing. And with more aerosols in the atmosphere, we had a little bit of a global dimming, not enough to affect the global warming signal, the increase in temperature, but enough to reduce pan evaporation rates because they're really limited, you know, they're really sensitive to the amount of solar radiation coming in. So someone, someone traced it back and made this linkage here with it. All right, let's talk about the energy budget method. And this is really what people use some variant of the energy budget method to actually calculate evaporation, it's indirect though, because we're measuring how much radiation is coming and we're measuring temperatures, stuff like that. We're not measuring directly at evaporation. We're getting an estimate of it. And if we look at this, this graphic right here, we've got different kinds of radiation coming in. So we have radiation coming in from above, from solar radiation, that RN. It's coming into this control volume where we have soil and trees and stuff like that. We've got heat going into the ground, that's G. You've got heat that leaves as um, electromagnetic radiation. This is called sensible heat. Something that you can sense. You can feel the heat coming off of this area. So that's electromagnetic radiation. Do, do you guys remember what form that takes? Jake, do you remember? Infrared. Infrared, so, so we get short wave and infrared and UV radiation coming in. So we get visual UV infrared. It heats everything up and then everything spits out infrared radiation. So that's what this H is, that's the energy leaving. And then we've got this, this is called latent heat. That, that's the L for latent. Latent heat refers to energy that leaves in water vapor. We'll talk about the latent heat of vaporization. That's the energy that water takes with it when it leaves the situation. How do we remember that when water freezes, it uh, releases energy and when water evaporates, it takes energy with it? That's kind of a fundamental thermodynamics thing we need to remember. Yeah, so when water evaporates, it takes energy with it. How do you how do you remember that just kind of intrinsically, intuitively? When you sweat, your body cools down, right? And what's happening to that water? From 
So what's the, what form is the water when it's on your body of sweat? Okay, and then when, when it evaporates, it goes into water vapor and what happens to your body? And when your body cools down, where's that heat going? Into the water vapor. So yeah, you're, you're always, you know, if you've got infrared goggles on, you'll see that our bodies are emitting infrared radiation. That's why you've got those emergency blankets that are tinfoil looking, right? They're reflective. Have you guys ever been in one of those? You should try it sometime. <laughs> bring some. <laughs> I'll bring one. I'll bring one. I have one. I will, we'll, I don't know. Yeah, whatever. Oh yeah, it's crazy. Jake, have you been in one of those? No, I haven't. Okay, got to try it, guys. Go out. If you're ever out there um, in the snow, uh, put one of those. There, you can get a little, little uh, it's kind of like a Kleenex, travel Kleenex size, box size, and it unfolds to this blanket that you can wrap around yourself. It's super thin, it's plastic. If you um, try one of those, it reflects all of your infrared radiation back on you and you warm up so quick. And so it, what, it, what it tells you is, is that your, your body's releasing a lot of heat all the time from infrared radiation. And so you put that on. If you put it on in the summertime, you're gonna start sweating immediately. If you put it on the wintertime, you're gonna feel real nice. Um, so that is the sensible heat. But then when you sweat, you're losing latent heat and that's in the water vapor. So when it evaporates, it's taking energy with it it's sucking that heat and that energy is now in the atmosphere as water vapor. So here's those terms. We've got latent heat, the latent heat of vaporization, uh, often indicated as lambda V. And this is the quantity of energy that must be absorbed to break the hydrogen bonds. These are the intermolecular bonds when evaporation takes place. So I shouldn't, this is a little confusing. It's the, it's the bonds, the polar bonds, right? The electromagnetic bonds between water molecules. So in water, they're all kind of connected, but um, uh, when you go into the atmosphere, now you've got free molecules of water that are by themselves. So there's a certain amount of heat it takes, joules per you know, cubic centimeter or whatever, per cubic meter to and, and it's just the, you know, if you've got a pot of water on the stove, it's sitting there with a the heat on it. It's absorbing that heat. It's absorbing that heat. It's absorbing that heat. And all of a sudden you hit that heat of vaporization and what happens? It boils, right? So what, that's, that's when you've hit the heat of vaporization. You, you, the water has absorbed enough energy so that I can evaporate. Um, so evaporation is accompanied by a transfer of heat off of the surface. The surface cools down. In condensation, the opposite's happening. And so when you condense, you're releasing that. And we talked about that. That's the other thing I shouldn't have said, freezing. When you condense, you're releasing um, heat into the air. That's that positive feedback that we get in, in clouds. And so a surface warms or the air warms up when condensation happens. Okay, so let's talk about latent heat flux. So now we're kind of getting into the nitty gritty here. Um, so lambda E is gonna be the rate of latent heat transfer per unit area, per unit time. And it's equal to the rate of evaporation, E, this is length per time, the density of the water, and then this energy coefficient. So let me just, uh, did I bring my bag? Didn't bring my bag. I can't wipe that out. So if you do all the units here, we have um, energy per length squared per time. Here we have um, length cubed, or sorry, mass over length cubed. And here we have length per time. Um, Okay, sorry, that's not what the units work out to be. Uh, so these are the units, it's energy per um, area per time, energy, energy per area per time. All right, latent heat evaporation, it's energy per mass. And in this case for water, it's about 2.5 millijoules per kilogram of water. 
So this, this latent heat transfer per unit area, this is super hard to measure. And so we, we have different ways of kind of getting at it. Um, I'm, what I did here is I rearranged this equation so that I said my evaporation rate is equal to this latent energy transfer rate divided by the heat of um, the heat of vaporization and the density of water. So this is this would be an evaporation rate that ultimately I'd like to calculate, but um, I can't do because this is super hard to measure. So let's break it down a little bit more. We have um, latent heat of vaporization plus um, the heat of fusion. So if we if we're sorry, uh, I'm talking about sublimation now. So we, this was evaporation. Now we're talking about sublimation. So for sublimation is we're going from ice to evaporation. And all I do is the same equation. I'm just adding now this, um, the, the latent heat of fusion. So we have to go from ice to water and then water to water vapor. So that's this number 0.334 millijoules per kilogram. And if you add those two together, you get the latent heat of sublimation. So we went from 2.5 megajoules per kilogram for vaporization to 0.334, so it's, it's much smaller. So I can break this, this um, difficult term down to an energy balance. And that energy balance is the short wave radiation coming in plus the long wave radiation coming in minus what you lose to the ground so as the ground heats up minus um, what comes out in infrared radiation, what's radiated back out to the atmosphere. Um, do we have any energy coming into in, uh, the system from water? So if you have a stream with a certain temperature, that's bringing in water to the system. And then minus any change in heat in the body uh, that we're interested in over time. So there's a ratio that we can use that describes the fraction of energy that's lost from a system to sensible heat, which is just temperature, right? The air heats up versus latent heat, which is water vapor. It's called the Bowen ratio. And the Bowen ratio has our sensible heat over our um, latent heat flux. So when Bowen ratio is greater than one, we're losing more energy to the as, as temperature than we are water vapors. That means we have drier conditions. That would be like uh, if you're on a parking lot and the sun's beating down, all that water vapor, I'm sorry, all that energy from the sun is being expelled as radiation, as sensible heat. You can feel that heat on your skin. Um, but if you're standing out over uh, well irrigated grass, like most of CMU in the summertime, you can feel that humidity coming off the grass that's that latent heat flux. And so most of the energy is gonna be coming out as water vapor. And that is going to be when our Bowen ratio is less than one. So let's just look at these energy fluxes over time. Uh, so we have, here's watts per meter squared. This is the energy flux. And we have measured energy fluxes as an experimental field. So let's see what happens. So they watered the field on day one. We're going through two days here. Here's our incoming solar radiation, this big black line. So that's coming into the system. What's going out of the system is lost to the ground. That's this gray line. So what, what's changing to the soil temperature? And then we have our H, which is our sensible heat flux. And then we have our E, L, which is our, um, uh, latent heat flux. So on day one, we have a pretty big amount of latent heat flux, uh, pretty similar to what's going to the ground and not a lot of sensible heat flux. But then the next day, what happens is it gets drier. And so that latent heat flux goes down. We evaporate a bunch of water here, the soil's drier, and now we're losing more energy to sensible heat than we are to latent heat. So what do you think the Bowman ratio is for day one, Val? If the Bowman ratio is H over E, sensible heat over latent heat. 
for day one. So here's H and here's E. Okay, great. So something like, yeah, exactly. Um, so it's less than one and that means we're losing more energy from the system to water vapor being evaporated. And then how does that change Dylan for day two? Closer to one. And yeah, it's actually probably gonna be a little bit greater than one because we have H over E. So maybe 1.1, something like that, right? So we're losing more energy to, to sensible heat as the fuel dries out. Okay, so to get this, um, ultimately what we want is to calculate evaporation as a function of energy that we can measure. So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna assume free water assumption, so no inflow or outflow of energy with the water. We're, not, we're gonna assume that we don't lose any energy to the ground. So we're making some assumptions here and we're taking that longer equation and simplifying it. So we'll solve this energy balance equation and, and put that Bowen ratio in. So the Bowen ratio, um, we can put it in terms of some of these, these uh, parameters that we can measure that we know, these constants. And then ultimately we get our um, evaporation rate, which is gonna be a function of the incoming radiation. So this is uh, short and long wave radiation up top. So that R, Rn, the density of water, the latent heat of vaporization, and then one plus the Bowen ratio, which is you know, a function of the sensible heat and our latent heat flux. In your book, they, they talked about some other equations as well. Um, this one I, I kind of teach because I think it's a little more intuitive, um, but we can, we can talk about those other ones as well. Um, so here's actually, someone trying to measure evaporation on a lake and they've got a buoy. This is a Bureau of Reclamation lake. So they're interested in how much water they're losing to evaporation. So they need to go buy a bunch of those little reflector balls and put it out there to reduce evaporation. So on this buoy, they've got a temperature. Let's see, do we have this? Yeah. Here's all the equipment on the buoy. We got a radiometer. So we know the incoming radiation and outgoing as well. So it looks down at the water and up at the sky. So how much radiation is coming down? How much is coming out the water? We've got air temperature and humidity, We've got pressure. Uh, we're measuring temperature in the water. We're measuring wind speed as well. And we can plug that into equa an equation that's a little more complicated than this, but it takes all those parameters and then calculates a, uh, an evaporation rate over time. So that's a, a, a kind of real-time data network that's being, that's being estimated out there. So let's just take a look at how evaporation might change over the, the country. Solar radiation, obviously a really critical component for that. So we're gonna have um, more energy to do evaporation in this part of the country than that. Um, we can actually calculate evapotranspiration countrywide. So this is millimeters per year average, evapo oh, sorry, meters per year average evapotranspiration um, across the country. And this is using um, satellite data along with some other national data sets. And what this is telling us is that if you look at, if you were to compare rainfall rates here, if we're evaporating somewhere around a meter down here, we're getting maybe up to two meters of rain. Um, so we're not evaporating all the rain that comes off. And so we get a lot more river flow. Out here, we could be evaporating um, an equal amount or, or more of the rainfall that actually falls out here in the desert. So there's a lot more potential, and, and this, is, this would probably be potential evapotranspiration um, than we actually get rainfall, right? So we're always kind of in a water deficit over here. All right, so the last part of this is we'll look at um, rainfall rates versus evapotranspiration rates at one of these agricultural stations. I stand up and stretch my legs. 
So CSU, I mentioned, has a network of weather stations where they're measuring all these kind of parameters that we need to calculate evapotranspiration. Measuring rainfall, soil moisture, solar radiation, humidity, all those things. And here's, uh, if you average it over the years, here's our evapotranspiration in inches. And there's our precipitation. This is for uh, a station in Fort Collins. So what do we notice from this graph, Jake, the top one? That there's much more evapotranspiration than precipitation. Yeah. So they're irrigating the land, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, and I guess, I guess there's two ways you can think about this. If this is actual evaporation that happens, right? You've got, obviously there's much more um, evaporation happening than precipitation. So if this is, if we're measuring actual evapotranspiration here, then we obviously were irrigating to meet this, this deficit right here, the difference between the evapotranspiration and precipitation. If this is um, potential evapotranspiration, meaning how much water could we evaporate if we had an unlimited supply of soil moisture, then this tells you how much you need to irrigate basically, if you want to make sure that your crops don't wilt. So clearly, you know, in the West, we've got a big difference between the rainfall and the evaporation rate. This is what it looks like seasonally. ET is typically higher than precipitation any time of the year, although um, depending on the year, maybe you have a little bit more precipitation and evapotranspiration, probably in the springtime, right? May, June time range. Of course, this is our growing season. It's going to be probably June to um, August, September. And this is where this gap right here is where we need to augment with ir irrigation in order to be able to grow crops. So on this website, and here's the website right here where you can look at this data. It's called Co Colorado Agricultural Meteorology. You can plug in a, on your given location so there's one actually on Orchard Mesa and you guys will look at some data from that. Um, you can plug in, what am I growing here? And for each of these types of crops, there's a factor associated with it. So we know that we talked about how alfalfa um, typically uses a lot of water. Um, that's this teal line right here. You've got um, corn is up there too. Um, reference ETs kind of be like the maximum amount of evapotranspiration that could happen. Basically bare soil, right? So different crops are going to have different demands. And so the way this works is, say I'm a potato farmer and I can look at this from past years and figure out, well, on average, I'm going to need, you know, I could, I could add this up. You can add up the cumulative evapotranspiration. So say I'm a potato farmer and here's my cumulative ET by the end of the growing season, I need about 10 inches of water to grow these potatoes. So that, that's one way you could use these data. And it shows you how, say you're like, okay, well I only have so much water. I've only got enough water to say put eight inches of water over my fields. If I say I've got 10 acres, I can do eight inches. That's so many acre feet. So given the amount of water I have, what do I wanna grow? Well, potatoes look pretty good. Uh, maybe I'm going to do some small grains or uh, maybe I could do some beans, something like that. I don't want to do alfalfa because that's going to be too much water. I don't know if that's a real problem that people face, but you know, that could be one of the other types of things you could do. And just know that this trend, we've got evapotranspiration. It's just kind of cruising, cruising, cruising over the month and precipitation. We're not getting a whole lot of action here. So that's, that's why we irrigate. Here's what those stations look like. And we got a, a agricultural meteorologist, hydrologist out here, checking all the equipment, measuring wind, radiation, vapor pressure, relative humidity, temperature and precipitation. All right, and then this is, um, these are some websites where you can actually get ev evapotranspiration data based on those, those weather uh, instrumentation. That's evaporation in a nutshell. 
Um, so we'll do some basic problems in the homework for it, just some basic calculations. A lot of it's unit conversion. I've got so many CFS. I need, I have, you know, I've estimated on over my growing season, I have two feet of evapotranspiration that I need to account for. How much water do I need to put on my field? So you go from a flow rate to a volume to a depth, dividing by area, right? Um, those are the kinds of calculations. And then on Tuesday, we'll talk about soil moisture. It's kind of a whole other can of worms. And then relate that back to crops and kind of crop management and how farmers think about um, irrigation schedules and stuff like that. So we've got a homework due, I think it's Friday.